Welcome to Cloud Native Compass, a podcast to help you navigate the vast landscape of the cloud native ecosystem. We're your hosts. I'm David Flanagan, a technology magpie that can't stop playing with new shiny things. I'm Laura Santa Maria, a forever learner who is constantly breaking production. EBPF is Turing complete and can be written in Rust. So obviously I'm sold. That's just two of the things we learned on today's episode. Want to learn more? Contrary to not so popular belief, eBPF is not some secret Berkeley green project that's out there to eat your refrigerator, but it is a gateway to becoming a Linux kernel maintainer. If you're curious about what EP eBPF is, why it matters, how to pronounce it, and how badly you can break your kernel when trying to learn it, this is the episode for you as we talk with Liz Rice, the author of Learning eBPF and Chief Open Source Officer at Isovalent. All right. Thank you. Uh, Liz, could you please say hello and tell us a little bit more about you? Hi. Yeah. So my name is Liz Rice. I am Chief Open Source Officer at Isovalent, which is the company that originally created Cilium. And uh, a lot of people will have heard of Cilium being based on eBPF. And earlier this year, I published a book about eBPF called Learning eBPF. <laughs> I feel like I may have answered more than one question in one go there. <laughs> hey, no, that's fine. That's fine. A little bit of context. Just us. Perfect. Yeah, good context, considering we're about to talk about eBPF and go into a little bit more detail there. So, yeah, awesome. All right. Well, let's just start. You know, not everyone is familiar with eBPF. So could you give us the, the TLDR? What do people need to know to understand the rest of the conversation today? So they don't need to know what it stands for. Um, it stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter, but honestly, forget that. It doesn't really help because it does a lot more than packet filtering now. So we tend to say the acronym doesn't really mean anything anymore. And um, what it really is, is the ability to run programs within the in, within the kernel, within the operating system kernel. So we can dynamically change the way that the kernel behaves by loading these eBPF programs. And I think when I say that, I have to make sure that people really know what I mean when I say the kernel. The kernel is the part of the operating system that interfaces between our applications and the hardware that the, you know, processor and, and its peripherals. So if you are writing to a file, you're doing anything over the network, writing anything to screen, even allocating memory, the kernel has to get involved. Your application can't do it directly. It has to ask the kernel for help. And the kernel is also coordinating all the different processes that might be running on the machine. And that means the kernel is involved whenever you're doing anything interesting really so it's a really great place to write things like observability tools and security tools and we can do that with ebpf and we also get to customize the way that the kernel behaves for the things that it takes on things like the networking stack we can modify the way that behaves with ebpf so it's really powerful and a really interesting way to instrument all of your different applications that are running on that one kernel. Nice. Huh. And here I was hoping you could, I was going to say, here I was hoping you could actually explain why it said Berkeley in the middle of all of it, but that's a whole uh, other yeah, joke, I, could I guess, say more than anything the, else. The original um, Berkeley <laughs> packet filter paper um, was written by two people whose names I can't quite remember right now, um, but they were at Berkeley at the time. So it was, oh, okay. a, you know, the, okay. the, the that makes more sense now. That it all originates from says like Lawrence Barkley Lab or however exactly that's called. Yeah. You know, just for fun for somebody like me who's like, why does it say Berkeley? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so I, I'm curious then, did you join Isovalent because you were really interested in eBPF or are you now really interested in eBPF because you've joined Isovalent? Like what came first? No, I really got interested in eBPF. The first time I heard of it, I saw Thomas Graff, who is the CTO of Isovalent, uh, talking about Cilium and eBPF at DockerCon back in 2017. And at the time, I thought, well, that's pretty interesting technology. And at that point, it was really cutting edge in the kernel. You needed, you know, it wasn't available to most people in production. It wasn't available to hardly anybody in the Linux distributions that they were using back then. 
But I thought this is a really interesting technology and um, I'd kind of kept an eye on it. A couple of years later, I started working on a project that was um, sort of using eBPF. And I was also, as part of learning about it myself, I was going out and doing talks. I, I find that, you know, the best way to make sure you really understand it is to try and explain something to somebody else. Uh, so, yeah, I'd started doing talks about eBPF as well. And um, through that, um, actually got invited back to the eBPF Summit in, I guess, 2020, which uh, Isovalent put on sort of on behalf of the eBPF community. And there was so much really cool stuff going on, you know, in the world of eBPF and particularly at Isovalent. It turns out I hadn't realized before that summit just how much Isovalent had been involved with eBPF right from the get-go. So Daniel Borkman, who's one of the three maintainers of eBPF in the kernel, was you know, one of the early engineers at Isovalent and he's still there. So, you know, we're so embedded in the way that eBPF has developed over the years. It's, it's you know, I, I really do get to work with the, the people who created it and the people who've been using it and had the vision for building things like Cilium. You know, so, yeah, I joined Isovalent because it's just absolutely full of really cool people doing really fun things with eBPF. <laughs> Awesome. Makes sense. So you started experimenting with VBPF in, in 2017. We're now in the latter half of 2023, which just seems absurd to me now. But like over those years, you've seen the adoption grow as we all have, especially across the, the industry and even the CNCF with projects like Pixie and Falco and of course Cilium as well. Um, why has that adoption grown so quickly for a relatively niche i don't know is it a niche technology i think it is like why are people point, i don't know i don't know it seems <laughs> yeah. like it's kind of everywhere so yeah it's one of those things that um i i guess expertise in it is pretty niche but a lot of people are using it without really even knowing that they're using it i mean there's probably people using cilium who don't realize that it's based on ebpf certainly a lot of people will be using things like tcp dump and never really sort of thought about eBPF that, and that, that's fine. That's, you know, there's so many really um, powerful tools that have been built. Um, I, I think, you know, things that uh, Brendan Gregg had popularized, um, you know, in the kind of 2017 period, you know, he was already out there talking about how Netflix were using eBPF for um, observability purposes, for tracing, for, you know, diagnosing and then uh, improving performance issues and, uh, you know, really popularizing the power of eBPF. Um, the reason why I think there was that kind of sudden upturn in adoption is the fact that the, the level of eBPF support in the kernel had reached a, a point, I think, around the 4.18 kernel version around that kind of time frame is where you really start getting sufficient eBPF support to do really interesting things. Um, the more modern your kernel is, the more additional capabilities in eBPF and probably lots of other areas of the kernel as well. Um, and, but there was this real turning point when I would say particularly when RHEL was probably the last of the distributions to um, kind of, it, it's, it's always you know, relatively cautious about upgrading to, to new versions of the kernel. And at the point where really all of the distributions were using a modern enough kernel, that meant you could just deploy these eBPF based tools in production, regardless of your distro. And I think that really made a huge difference to the adoption. Yeah. Awesome. So you mentioned the Berkeley packet filter and for the people that are not aware, it's like a networking thing that allows you to do IP tables like stuff in the kernel. I, I'm not trying going to go into it in any more detail than that because I'll, I'll make an absolute mess of it. But it does networking <laughs> stuff, right? It blocks packets, it reroutes packets, it does other stuff. But eBPF has kind of grown beyond that now. We're seeing it used for a whole variety of different technologies like Falco and Pixie. Um, is there like... What's the right way to phrase this question? Really, I should have had it prepared. But why has it extended beyond this? Why does it have these new capabilities? What is it enabling within the kernel for people? Why is it interesting to you and to others? I know that's a very broad question. But. Yeah. So, so I think the the original 
idea of packet filtering was you know, to be able to look at each incoming packet and say, you know, make decisions about what to do with it, with that packet. Um, and I think in the very first place, it was really just do, am I interested in sort of seeing this packet? I, maybe I want to filter, you know, packets that are going to a particular port so that I can count them or something like that. Um, so it was making fairly simple decisions about, you know, what kind of, what to do with these, with these packet filters. The extended part involved, um, I think a few different trains of thought. One was the idea that if you extended this sort of relatively small instruction set that could be used to, to examine packets, if you turn that into something a bit more kind of like a virtual machine instruction set, um, it, when, if you look at BPF bytecode, it's very reminiscent of like machine code. Um, you know, it's all about registers and loading values into registers and, and comparing them and, and jumping to other instructions is very, very similar to, to machine code. So there was this idea that having a, a, a virtual machine in the kernel could allow you to do all sorts of interesting things. There was the idea that maybe you could attach these programs to other points in the kernel, not just to incoming packets, but you could make decisions or change the behavior at other points in the kernel. Um, and I think the last major thing that distinguished extended from, from its predecessors is what's called eBPF maps. And maps are these data structures that you can access from within an eBPF program, and you can share them between eBPF programs, and you can also access them using system calls from user space. So it's, it's a way of exchanging information between user space and eBPF programs or between multiple different eBPF programs. And all those things kind of combined has turned out to be really powerful to the extent that one of my colleagues recently did a talk at um, one of the kind of Linux kernel developer conferences where he showed that eBPF is now Turing complete, which is pretty cool. <laughs> a question just on that, right? Because, you know, the talks I've seen, you know, from yourself and others in this space, when you talk about eBPF, one of the, the things that's always mentioned is the fact that the eBPF sandbox, the virtual machine can and should never crash. Mm -hmm. Is that... Is that still true even with the ability for the eBPF programs to communicate with each other and with user space programs? Yeah, exactly. So the reason we're able to make that claim is because of a, a, a thing in the kernel called the eBPF verifier. So as you load a program into the kernel, it goes through this verification process, which is really analyzing all the possible paths through the program. And, uh, ensuring that, well, first of all, it will run to completion. Um, so there's a, a long time ago, that used to mean no loops at all. Now that's been um, kind of improved and optimized and you can have loops. Um, it's uh, checking for things like, uh, there's only a limited set of what's called helper functions that you can make from an eBPF program. And the set that you can call depend on really the event that triggered it. So if you were being triggered because a network packet arrived, then you can call helper functions that are related to looking at that network packet, but you can't, for example, ask for, well, what's the user space process associated with this packet? Because there is no user space process associated at that time. Whereas if you were uh, in an eBPF program attached to a user space program making a system call, then you absolutely could, ask a helper function to give you the, the process ID. So the verify is checking that all this sort of contextual um, helper functions are being used appropriately and that memory access is safe, that if you're going to dereference a pointer, you have to explicitly check that it's not nil before you do so because dereferencing a nil pointer, if you know anybody has ever written a C program, they will have crashed their C program by dereferencing a nil pointer, I guarantee it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the verify is really just checking that that program is safe to run, safe in the sense that it can't crash the machine, that memory access is safe. Um, of course, it can't tell the difference between, uh, you know, maybe I'm a legitimate networking packet that's uh, a, a legitimate eBPF program that's filtering network packets 
you know, maybe I'm protecting against DDoS attacks, or maybe I'm a malicious eBPF program and I am just throwing away packets for fun. You know, <laughs> the verifier can't tell the difference between right. those two things. But when we talk about being safe to run in this context, we really mean it's not going to crash or hang the machine. Okay. Cool. And I think worth pointing Laura's out. Laura's thinking face on here. That, yeah, I've got my thinking face on. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Liz. Um, no, keep going. Keep going. Well, it's the, the thing that really distinguishes eBPF from writing a kernel module. So you always could extend the kernel, always, for a very long time. You've been able to extend the kernel by writing kernel modules. But people are pretty reluctant to install kernel modules because it's if there is some kind of bug in it if it does crash it's going to bring down the whole machine and there's no um kind of safety net like what the ebpf verifier is bringing makes sense so out of curiosity like obviously we're talking a lot more in-depth kernel kind of things and obviously you referenced if you've ever developed a c program you know what this is like in machine code and things like that who would you say are probably the most common user that you encounter or like the, the people who are really using this the most, who do you yeah. think this is the most relevant for, I guess, right now? So lots of people will use eBPF through tooling that's built on it. So, I mean, David mentioned, you know, there's various different projects in the CNCF. There's all the um, BPF trace and, and uh, the BCC family of tools that people can use on the command line to do, observability there's there's lots of different tools that have been built on ebpf as a platform and i think for the vast majority of people that's how they'll really experience it they'll use things like cilium or um you know or falco or pixie and they may uh, be interested in the fact that it's using ebpf but they don't actually have to get involved in the details which turns out to be a really good thing because, I mean, I'm I'm the sort of person who really wants to understand, you know, like how the sausage is made. I I, I, I want to kind of get inside and get a feel for like, how is this really working? You can uh, learn about eBPF programming. Uh, you know, it's relatively easy to get, uh, you know, things like a hello world or, or, you know, some basic networking capabilities running in eBPF programs that you've written yourself. But you do quite quickly start hitting the point where you're interacting with kernel data structures. And at that point, you kind of need to understand what those data structures represent and what the effect of you changing them might have. Um, so it, it, it does quite quickly turn into kernel programming. So I kind of say that on the one hand, most people just don't need to know anything about the details of it at all. But if they're interested, it's relatively accessible for people who are comfortable with programming to, to kind of dip your toe in. And then if you really want to become an expert eBPF programmer, which I by no means consider myself at all, that really does start to require kind of kernel expertise. But fortunately, I work with lots of people at ISF Agent who have that kernel expertise. <laughs> so would you say this is the, the gateway to actually becoming a Linux maintainer? Honestly, yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 it, I, I've not done it, but it never crossed my mind that I would ever make a contribution to the Linux kernel. Right. But now I've kind of in that world, I sort of start to think, oh, you know, if if I had another twenty five hours in the, the day, temptation the is high. <laughs> the temptation is high to go get involved. Definitely. I understand. <laughs> I've asked my one obligatory question, David. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like I like that I like that discussion, right? Because it's it's one of those questions. Like um I do a couple of talks on that touch on eBPF, right? I don't go deep on it because I'm not that smart. But I always do the same demos. And it's the IO Visor uh, BPFCC tools demo. Um mm -hmm. specifically I show off exec snoop uh and open snoop because you know in the SRE platform, DevOpsy world, it's quite interesting and important from a security perspective and an automation perspective to be able to show when certain sensitive files are opened on a disk and the ebpf makes that really really simple and another really cool demo is just by using exec snoop you can actually monitor for sudo and set uid bit one 
binaries on the machine. And so when people elevate their privileges, you can get notifications for that kind of stuff too. And the question is always like, how much do I need to know about eBPF to then start doing tools similar to that? And then you show them the source code and it's like 20 lines of Python. It's not a lot to do these kind of things. And I think that's because I feel like people can start to build eBPF programs using traces without going deep into it. In the same way that with containers, we can all run containers on our machine, but you don't really need to understand what a control group is or a namespace is anymore. And I feel like eBPF may make that same transition, probably already has made that same transition. So I'm going to flip that around a little bit and throw the question to Liz. Uh, if people do see these demos, they listen to this and they're like, okay, eBPF is really cool. What are the languages and the SDKs that they can go and start to work with right away to experiment with the, the new tech? Yeah, so you kind of have to answer that question in two parts. There's the actual eBPF program itself that's going to run in the kernel. And then there's the user space part that might interact with it. There are some occasions where you don't even need a user space part. So, for example, if you're doing networking uh, functions, uh, sometimes they don't need any kind of user space interaction because you can just load them into the kernel and they can they can do what they need to do but usually we're going to have both these parts for the kernel the program's going to be in ultimately it's going to be in ebpf byte core byte code form I talked about there being these byte code instructions that look like machine code you could just write the machine code by hand. Apparently, there are people who do that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for, for, for me, I, I would rather write in a, in a slightly higher language than that. And the languages are restricted by being, they have to be able to compile down to bytecode. So uh, the compilers that support it right now are Clang, GCC, with both of which can compile C, and also the Rust compiler. Um, I'm not aware of there being other programs that support BPF bytecode as a target. So, uh, yeah, C or Rust really become your choice there. Um, there is a little bit of a caveat in that there is this project called IOVisor BCC. David mentioned the, the tools and, and things like OpenSnoop and ExecSnoop that come from that project. And BCC gives you some friendly kind of macros such that you can write your code in a sort of hybrid of Python and C, and it, and it takes care of a few takes care of a few things for you uh, from your from your C programs. But then there's the, the user space side of things, and there you have a much wider choice. I mean, really, you're you're not restricted at all except that you probably want some sdks that will make system calls for you and make it easier for you to uh, interact with the ebpf program through that syscall interface um, there are there's a go sdk there's a rust uh, sdk in fact there's a couple of go ones um, and there's a c one which is probably i would say today the most widely used called libbpf um, it, it, Cilium uses uh, Go. We have a, a Go eBPF uh, library, but I think a lot of the projects outside outside of that are probably directly using libbpf. Yeah, you said one thing there that I completely disagree with, and it's, you said you have a choice between Rust and C. That's not a choice. I knew this was coming. <laughs> I knew this was coming. I knew it. <laughs> of course, Dave's going to talk about Rust. I'm going to just break in before he gets going on it. Um, you know, it it occurs to me, you there was the mention of like, you know, when containers came around and things like that, things kind of change. And as there are more and more languages that people are familiar with that you can compile down to the eBPF byte code, how often do you find people getting into trouble like they used to do when containers first came around because they didn't quite know what they were doing, but they kind of got it enough to get away with it? So how often do you find people getting in trouble and like, how do you get them out? Like, that's always my question. It's yeah. like, how do you troubleshoot this thing? Especially when this is like kernel level and you can really, really mess things up fast. Yeah. I, I would say that there's probably two major ways that people get caught out. Um, one of them is around the kind of 
the tool chain and installing things that are compatible with each other because, you, you know, every kernel version has different eBPF support and then you need, you know, maybe your user space libraries that maybe are or aren't compatible and different distributions of Linux might have different, um, you know, versions of different uh, either libbpf or, or tools, things like the the BCC tools, or um, particularly mm -hmm. there's a thing called BPF tool that you can use for managing uh, BPF programs and uh, it, making sure that you've got a compatible set of the packages, the source code, the kernel, the tools that you want can trip you up in numerous different ways. Um, and the other thing that catches people out, once they've got everything installed and everything seems to be compatible and they've started compiling some code and then they go to load it into the kernel and they hit verification errors. And um, I, I would say over, over the last few years, there's been a lot of improvement in the kind of information that the verifier gives you about why it's objecting to whatever it is it's objecting to. But uh, I have certainly, that there's a blog post somewhere that describes the verifier as a fickle, fickle beast, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. So, you know, we've covered a lot about EBPF so far. Um, and just kind of to understand the landscape right now, like it's heavily used for networking. Cilium has gone all in on eBPF, even towards the service mesh angle now. Uh, as Avalon even now have Tetragon going for the security angle and trying to help people with that. And, uh, you know, we've seen like Pixie and Falco to do more security and monitoring, automated observability, all of this stuff. Is there... As I don't know if like this an EBPF maturity curve, right? But as people start to do more of it and the skills become more aware or people are using it more, um, will EBPF creep into like our day to day application code? Do you see people using EBPF to write, you know, their CMSs or their, you know, proprietary applications? Like I, I don't know what those use cases are. I don't know if they exist, but will EBPF become more than what it is today? Which is a bit of a forward thinking question, but maybe yeah, you've got some thoughts. It, it's really interesting to sort of speculate about what you could do and also what would be useful. But I think one interesting parallel is the way that um, networking capabilities that used to be in user space have migrated into the kernel. Um, TCP stack, you know, I am old enough to remember when that was more commonly in user space, <laughs> you know, that you'd use a TCP library. Um and now we, we just expect the kernel to take care of that. And I think what eBPF will allow us to do is to gradually move more of that kind of functionality into the kernel, but in a way that doesn't require everybody to take the, the leap at the same time, because we don't all have to be running the same eBPF programs. Um, so I think something like Service Mesh is a really great example where um, Cilium as a as a CNI, a networking component for, for Kubernetes, is in this really great sort of position in the kernel to be able to, you know, pick up network packets and put them where they need to be and observe them and report on them and do kind of security related operations on them, all of which are very much the kind of things that we expect from a service mesh. Today, we can't do everything in the kernel. I mean, theoretically, I think we could, but in practice, I think all the kind of layer seven operations, we're using a user space proxy to do that. We're using Envoy to do that. Um, I think over time, you know, I expect that in, you know, some number of years time, we all of that code will be in the kernel, but maybe the, you know, Kubernetes will be in the kernel too. Who knows? Maybe that's the kind of future <laughs> hey, evolution. Why not? You know, so if you fancy rewriting Kubernetes, perhaps we should all do it in Rust in, in EBPF. <laughs> <laughs> David's looking yeah, like he might idea. actually do that. <laughs> yeah, no, he might. He might. <laughs> I mean, I am not personally writing any Kubernetes components in Rust, but people are exploring uh -huh. that these days. Um, so uh -huh. you never, uh -huh. you never know, right? I don't trust that statement that you're not doing it yet. No, I, I, I'm not. I don't have time. I'm too busy talking to you. <laughs> All right. Well, 
Is there anything else, Liz, you would like us to throw at you to ask before we, we wrap this up? Anything that's just sitting on the tip of your tongue waiting to be said, sorry. Yeah, no, there is one thing I would like to mention, which is the upcoming EBPF Summit, because if people oh, right. are interested in, you know, hearing more about what's going on in, in the kind of EBPF community, um, learning more about how it's being used, seeing some of the kind of interesting directions that people are going with it and learning more about the future of EBPF itself. EBPF Summit, it's online, it's free. You know, it's a virtual conference. This is going to be, I think, the fourth time that we've held it. Um, it's on September the 13th. And uh, yeah, come come join in. If you'll go to ebpf.io, you'll find the link to the summit there. And uh, yeah, it's it's always been a really nice kind of community feel event. So I'm really looking forward to it. Excellent. All right. If you want to shamelessly plug anything else yourself, as a valent, anything else, feel free to <laughs> mention it now or forever hold your peace. We'll make sure all the links end up in the show notes as well. I guess it would be remiss of me not to mention learning EBPF. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> which is available either for you know if you want the pdf version you can download that from isovalent.com uh, or you can you know order it from your favorite local bookseller or get it from amazon if that's your bag <laughs> shop local exactly <laughs> all right well thank you so much for your time pleasure well, thank you liz thanks for joining us if you want to keep up with us consider subscribing to the podcast on your favorite podcasting app, or even go to cloudnativecompass.fm. And if you want us to talk with someone specific or cover a specific topic, reach out to us on any social media platform. Until next time, when exploring the cloud native landscape, on three. On three. One, two, three. Don't forget Don't your compass. Don't forget your compass. <laughs>